Hello, my name is Barbara Hansen Forsyth, and I'm the Senior Manager of Collections and Exhibitions at Mingay International Museum here in San Diego. Today, I'm delighted to speak with you about two of my favorite San Diego artists, the couple Ella Marie and Jackson Woolley. They were an incredibly prolific and talented husband and wife team. They represent a time when artists and craftsmen could support themselves by producing a combination of smaller commercial wares and larger architectural commissions. They epitomized the designer craftsman movement when one could successfully walk the line between fine art and craft, the experimental and the functional. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, we have a slightly tongue in cheek title here, but I hope the selection of title becomes apparent as I tell the story um, behind these legendary designers. So Ella Marie was born in San Diego in 1913. Her father, Phineas S. Packard, was the founder of an independent publishing company in San Diego called the Arts and Crafts Press. She studied at SDSU, then called San Diego State College, and at the Art Center School in LA, and she was trained as a painter. In fact, Wooley painted two WPA murals on the campus of San Diego State College that sadly are no longer there. Jackson was born in Pittsburgh in 1910, and he went to Carnegie Institute of, ne of Technology. Trained as a Shakespearean actor, he moved to San Diego in 1935 to perform at the Old Globe. So here you're seeing the Woolies on the left in 1954 and on the right in 1955, where they're actually installing, um, they're taking photos of an installation of a sh Allied Craftsman show at the Fine Arts Gallery here in San Diego that's now known as the San Diego Museum of Art. Now what you're looking at here are some old yearbooks from Francis Parker, a, a progressive private school here in San Diego, still here. Um, this yearbook is from the late um, 30s or early 40s. Um, they, they had kind of these composite yearbooks that comprise many years. Um, so on the left, you're seeing on this group of women, Ella Marie is the woman furthest to the left, sort of seated on the railing. And on the right, you're seeing a young Jackson doing um, after school folk dancing in 1938, an activity he was known to love throughout his life. They got married in 1940 while they were teachers here. And then uh, Jackson went off to serve in World War II. So here's another um, yearbook this one from 1942 to 1943, maybe. <laughs> and um, you can see the couple with their figures eight and nine here. Um, and you can see that Jackson is wearing his uniform, which tells me that he was probably home on a visit from the war and joined this faculty beach party. Um, it's funny that their name, Wooly, is misspelled throughout all these yearbooks, the same person probably filling out the, doing the handwriting and got it wrong every time. After the war, uh, he went to, uh, Jackson went to Claremont for graduate school in art. And that is where they got introduced to enameling in, Claremont, in 1947 through a demonstration given at Scripps College by the ceramicist Richard B. Patterson. They were both completely taken with the medium. Ella Marie was drawn to the unique properties of enameling. There are things you can do in enamels that you can't do in anything else, she said. The permanence of the color and that marvelous surface and the depth of color that gives us so much light. For Jackson, it was the mysterious uncertainty of the firing process. He said, it's almost like magic because you put this powder on it and it melts and becomes something else. The colors are so good and so different from paint. So on the left, you're seeing the Woolies in the late 1940s, looks like it's at Windy, Winds and Sea Beach. And on the right in 1948, 
in front of their home, also in Windensee, where they lived for just about a year before they moved to Point Loma to their home in 1949, the home that they remained for the duration of their lives and that they um, routinely expanded to meet their studio needs. The Woolies' earliest enamels, made between 1947 and 1953, were for the most part functional, intended for use or display in homes and offices. Among their favorite forms were plates, ashtrays, and boxes. While occasionally each artist worked separately, most of this early work was produced through a close collaborative partnership between husband and wife. They signed and numbered these pieces sequentially, based on the order in which they were produced. Like the work of the Cubist painters who inspired them, the Woolies' compositions included overlapping images of faces and figures seen from varying points of view, suggesting multiple vantage points and perspectives. They were mostly self-taught in the absence of available instruction. They were part of a new aesthetic that combined art and craft. They had a strong work ethic and were known to be both practical and disciplined. They set a weekly quota of round trays and to accomplish this prodigious output, it, they developed a streamlined approach to enameling. Astonishingly, astonishingly, they made 5,000 plates in a five year period from 1948 to 1953, all of them unique with only one assistant, a neighbor and fellow actor whom Jackson would later direct at the Old Globe. His name was Thomas Royal. Here you see an, an assortment of plates from this period, um, specifically from about 1947 to 1950, um, that are currently in various museums and private collections around the country. The influence of European modern art is apparent in their work, especially their early work. So on the left, I'm showing a, a plate um, from the same period, about 1947 and 1950, that's currently at the Dallas Museum of Art. And on the right, Picasso's famous synthetic cubist masterwork, Three Musicians, from 1921. The Woolies found commercial and critical success early. One of their early plates from 1949, Boadicea, was shown in the Syracuse Museum of Fine Arts 11th Ceramic National in 1949 and was acquired for their permanent collection at that time. So that's just a couple of years after they started doing enamel, pretty impressive. The subject depicts Queen of the Iceni, the, um, who was a leader of a Celtic tribe in Roman Britain, who was known for her ferocity in battle. She's a symbol of bravery and patriotism with several literary references. So this plate, besides being one of their first artworks to enter a museum, also reveals their erudition and knowledge of classical literature. On the right is another early work that um, is part of uh, the San Diego Museum of Arts collection, and it entered their collection in 1948. It's called Inner Self. Just a couple more pieces showing the variety of designs from this early period. These. Um, are part of the collection of the Enamel Arts Foundation in Los Angeles, which has a sizable collection of woolly pieces. Other examples of small scale decorative objects and jewelry are being shown here, such as um, a pendant by Ella Marie on the left, that's also at the Dallas Museum of Art, and a pretty groovy necklace by Jackson on the right, that's probably from the 60s, and from a private collection. And this, in the center is box number 4104 from the 1950s. That's also part of the uh, Enamel Arts Foundation. <laughs> Despite staying busy with all of this enamel work, uh, Jackson continued to pursue acting. So I had to show this, um, this group of photos from his performance in Taming of the Shrew at the Old Globe from 1950. Jackson repeatedly kept trim by adhering to a strict vegetarian diet, running, dancing, getting lots of exercise, and surfing. By 1954, both, both Ella 
Marie and Jackson turned their focus away from the small functional forms that had occupied their attention since 1947 and launched a new series of wall-mounted panels. Unlike most of their earlier work that was done collaboratively, these were often produced independently. In here, this is um, one done by Jackson called uh, Reclining Female Figure. It's from 1957. Here's some more examples of wall-mounted panels. These are all by uh, Jackson, except for the Harlequin in the Sun, which is that yellow figure in the center. That was a collaborative work, and it's notable for its early use of repoussé metal um, that landed it in a 1959 issue of Craft Horizons. Um, the technique of repoussé basically just means hammering into the reverse side of the metals to kind of create a relief pattern or texture. And it, um, from this point on, shows up frequently in the work of the Woolies. The shell on the right from 1957 is a little bit unusual for Jackson because he tended to favor figurative work during this period, whereas Ella Marie tended to favor still lives and abstract designs. So here we're seeing her important and beautiful flower arrangement from 1957 on the left that you can see includes some mosaic work as well as enamel work. And on the right, Frugant, from about 1960, um, showing how um, her compositions became increasingly abstract and they become even more abstract later on. So I already um, alluded to their early critical and commercial success, but it's also worth pointing out that they were leaders in the field of crafts in general and enameling in particular. In 1951, only four years after they started enameling, their work was featured in Kenneth Bates' seminal publication, Enameling, Principles and Practice. Jackson joined the board of the American Craft Council in 1957. And by 1958, they were featured in a second book, Enameling on Metal by Oppie Untracht. Jackson and Ella Marie were also vocal participants at the Silomar, the important 1957 conference of American craftsmen that covered many areas of concern to the design field, such as the blurring of lines between fine and applied arts, craft and production, rustic and modern, functional and conceptual. Enameling had made a comeback in recent years, which threatened a cheapening of the craft. The enamels and glass panel, chaired by Jackson, discussed two general problems. First, how to develop efficient production methods without lowering aesthetic standards. And second, how to achieve adequate distribution without crass commercialism. Ultimately, he had, quote, hope that our craft may be of service to the fine arts by helping to break down prejudice against modern art in general. Ella Marie was also an active voice at this conference. Here she speaks on the importance of design and gives some insight into how they successfully managed to produce all those unique plates in the 1940s. Quote, we discovered that it was better to work directly in the enamel than to draw and paint a design and then try to reproduce it in enamel. We made much use of the scrapito technique. We found that the very movement of the drawing tool on the enamel surface is so different from a pencil on paper that the design is affected by this physical action. We also learned early in our career that it was difficult to repeat exactly another enamel design. The working process helps to produce the result. For this reason, we also had to reach the conclusion that we could not make designs to be copied by others for faster reproduction and a larger volume of sales. So there were countless mentions of the Woolies in Craft Horizons mag magazine which thankfully can now be accessed digitally. Very helpful in a pandemic. Um, and, and the articles discussed everything from exhibitions they participated in, as well as the conferences they were part of, and um, the many, many allied craftsmen shows in San Diego. So on the left, you're seeing um, Ella Marie and Jackson's work, that um, almost totem piece in the lower center. Um, that was from 19, October 1956. And on the right, um, this is an example of El Marie's work in the Designer Craftsman USA 1960 exhibition. That's the work on the bottom there. So 
So the post-war period is a complicated one. On the one hand, there was a sense of optimism for the future with the baby and housing boom that defined the era. On the other hand, this was a time when women who had gained some freedoms during World War II were essentially being told to return to the kitchen, to be homemakers, and the housing boom itself resulted in a lot of bland, planned communities. However, American art really rose to prominence during this time. Think of abstract expressionism, pop art. These were movements dominated by men. Yet, in the field of craft and design, there was room for both genders. The GI Bill offered veterans the option to go to college and pursue career in the arts, but a surprising number of women were working in the field as well, sometimes independently and sometimes part of a husband-wife team. The housing boom created a lot of homes that needed to be furnished, which helped reestablish craft and design as a viable career path. This national phenomenon with a strong San Diego representation was the focus of Crafting Opportunity, the exhibition I curated last year at the Central Library downtown. So in this slide, um, on the left, you're seeing photo, a photo of the, um, some Allied Craftsmen members, which um, I've mentioned that many times now, the Allied Craftsmen, um, that was and still continues to be um, a group of San Diego designers and artists. Um, and and the, the group kind of supports crafts in all mediums. And this picture was taken in about 1953. Jackson is the guy with the striped shirt at the back. Ella Marie's not in this photo. Uh, on the right is probably the most iconic husband and wife team in the history of design, Charles and Ray Eames. They revolutionized industrial design by introducing molded plywood, an inexpensive yet durable material that could be made into practically any ergonomic shape. So just showing, I mean, there are countless and countless um, artist designer couples in this era, but I just included a few here. Um, so you've got um, Edwin and Mary Shire uh, on the upper left corner. They were potters and I included them because like the Woolies, um, even though they were trained in the arts in general, they really didn't get any formal training in ceramics. So they were self-taught, had a home studio, and like the Woolies, landed a piece in a museum really, really early on, like I think a year after they started, they got a piece in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, the rest are um, San Diego couples. Um, below the Shires, you've got the um, Rodakoviches, who had a, a studio in Encinitas, and they did all kinds of things, but were probably best known for their jewelry. And then on the right, you've got a picture of Wayne and Barbara Chapman. Um, the picture on top was taken in 1969, um, and then the one on the bottom um, in 2016. And they are, as far as I know, still happily married in Solana Beach and still making art. So the Woolies were known to be humble, but they were also really ambitious. Those 5,000 unique plates were, as Ella Marie put it, marvelous training and discipline, preparing the way for doing larger things. Immensely prolific and with an expansive vision for integrating their medium into daily life, the Woolies also produced several large scale architectural projects, mostly murals, between the years of 1959 and 1965. We worked morning, afternoon, and sometimes into the evening, Jackson said. It was always a struggle. As far as carrying out a design, each of us did our own. I did most of the repoussé, and Ella Marie did the flat pieces. So this is their first um, architectural mural called Biblio Cosmos. It was done in 1959 for the Fresno County Library, and it measures about 32 by four and a half feet. It took 416 enameled copper plates of various sizes. And um, if you can imagine that the largest their kiln at that time would allow was about nine by nine inches, it took a really long time to complete this mural. Um, the theme of the composition is the Dewey Decimal System of Book Classification. So um, just to show a couple details here. You've got social sciences on the left and language. And then you've got um, history, geography, 
and biography. And then um, literature, I believe, is that uh, Pegasus on the lower right. And maybe the top one is science or biology. The next big commission in 1960 was for another library, this one in Whittier, which is in LA. Um, so on the left, you're seeing librarians from that time getting their card catalog in order. Remember card catalogs. Um, and then on the right is a more contemporary image of the same piece. The library calls it a tree of life mural, but the title given, it to, given to it by the Woolies is Wisdom. Now here we're seeing um, a, a photo of an LA commission, the Pacificana mural. That was done in 1963. It was a 10 foot by 24 foot enameled copper repoussé wall. And it was an interior mural commissioned for the first floor waiting room of the Pacific Employers Group Insurance Companies building. The designer craftsman team, the Woolies, uh, chose the sea motif because the word Pacific was part of the business name. According to the Union Tribune article on the left, um, some people saw bubbles, others saw sea plants or creatures, but either way, a shimmering wall of color was visible through a wide expanse of glass as uh, the building was approached. Not every design they made was well received, however. Here's a 1962 sketch for a 27 foot mural proposed by the Woolies for the San Diego Central Courthouse on Broadway. Um, it was not well received by San Diego's conservative side and despite endorsements from prominent figures such as the director of the Fine Arts Gallery, as well as various architects and artists, the County Board of Supervisors chose a blank wall instead. This was never realized. Hang on here. Okay. Bear with me. Okay. One of their most ambitious and time consuming public commissions was decorating the sides of the stage and the foyer of the Civic Center, where they experimented with crinkling and crushing copper and used very little enamel. The sculptural reliefs and light reflectors were, were the result of nearly a year's worth of work. Here's some uh, details. It was also not universally well received. Some critics called it copper Reynolds rack or cookie cutters. Apparently, the reflection of the copper could be distracting for the audience. Moreover, the elements were not cleaned on a regular basis, which dulled their aesthetic effects. And a San Diego Tribune article from 1979 quotes Jackson as saying, perhaps I have the right to demand rather than recommend the removal of the copper work, since attention and neglect have reduced it to a visual libel on my late wife and me. It has since been removed and the pieces scattered for sale. There's an example of one of the pieces on the right. Just wanted to show two more smaller scale works by Ella Marie that are contemporary with their architectural com commissions because they were working on smaller pieces um, simultaneously. And you can kind of see them influencing each other. The one on the left, well, these are both in Mingay's permanent collection. The one on the left, is called Weather Report number 522, and it's from around 1960. The one on the right is untitled, um, maybe just a little bit later, mid-60s, and it includes um, enameling again, like we saw before. And then here's um, a mural also from probably about 1961, 1962. It's three foot by eight feet, um, so a little smaller than their architectural murals. And this one was featured in California Design 8, which is the 1962 um, edition. So California Design was a super important series of exhibitions and catalogs that was held at the Pasadena Art Museum, now the Norton Simon. Um, 
uh, featuring California designer crafts people of the period and giving them an invaluable opportunity to promote their work. So uh, now we're <laughs> back to our money theme. The Woolies jointly created this custom exterior mural named Variations on a Gold Theme for the former First National Bank building, now known as now it's new, a Union Bank. Um, and it's located on uh, B Street between 5th and 6th Avenue in downtown San Diego. It was installed in October of 1965 and is comprised of 216 components. It was 12 feet high and 36 feet wide and came to a total weight of 1,750 pounds. Specific details found in the composition include ancient and modern coins, gold nuggets, and variations of an old alchemist symbol of gold, a circle with a dot in the center. This mural, along with the many other bank art projects commissioned during this time period by popular artists such as Millard Sheets, demonstrates that bank executives were willing to invest in art to engage the public. When it came to the Minge, so it's now in our permanent collection, it was installed in our former satellite location in Escondido, where it currently resides and can still be seen at 155 West Grand Avenue up in Escondido. Though now it's um, on the wall of a, the Catholic college, they agreed to, to keep it there. Um, an interesting story attesting to their perfectionist tendencies um, is that apparently after when it was being installed at the bank and after all the union workmen had gone home on a Friday night after installing, um, Ellen Marie decided she didn't like the color of one section. And since the scaffolding was still there, Jackson went back up and removed the piece for them to work on and they returned it that Sunday. This project compared to say the one at the Civic Center was pretty universally well received. And when it finally went out of vogue in the 1990s, Union Bank donated it to the Minge, um, probably thanks to um, our founder, um, Martha Longene Longenecker's connections. Um, and in fact, in an email on file that we have from her, and I should say that Martha Longenecker, Longenecker was also an allied craftsman member, um, she wrote, Ellen Marie and Jackson Woolley of San Diego were personal friends of mine over many years, beginning in the 1940s following World War II. We actually attended our first introduction to enameling together. And that was, and she goes on to say, is the same class at Scripps College that, or the same demo that, um, that the Woolleys had attended. And so that's how, and so they, they were friends ever since. And she went on to say, the Woolies devoted their joint energies to developing their skills to become leaders in the field. Now, thankfully, this work is going to be deinstalled, conserved, because it's gotten a little bit beaten up by the elements over the years, and reinstalled in our transformed Minge International Museum. So this is a rendering um, of what's going to be our courtyard garden, and you're kind of seeing how the space could be activated here, be a really um, wonderful urban park. And compared to say where it is on that building in Escondido, it's gonna be more, it's gonna be easier for people to see. It'll be a little bit lower to the ground. Um, people can really get close to it and examine it. Here's another um, rendering of that space at night. So we're really, I mean, um, we're just, very excited about the, the prospect of um, reinstalling this. But though I should say that it's gonna be quite a project because we don't have, it's, it's over 200 pieces as I, as I mentioned, and we don't really have a roadmap. So the amount of work we're gonna to have to do to kind of keep track of where all those elements go, all that documentation, it's gonna be pretty interesting. So after variations on a gold theme, there was a period of revaluation. That was essentially their last big architectural commission. And afterwards, both artists changed direction. So this is um, the catalog from their one-man exhibition 
or I should say in the case two, there was both of them in this exhibition. It was called Enamel at Plast and Plastic and it was at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts in 1972. In the catalog, they explain their individual approach to their work. I'll start with Ella Marie first. She says, when I turned again to smaller work, I soon realized that I had acquired some personal cliches of design and technique that I was using in an automatic way to do things I knew too well how to do. An upheaval, a new start, a fresh eye were needed. I found my clue to a new approach by taking a, a new look at our everyday city environment, at traffic signs, commercial emblems, storefronts. These all said, simplify, clarify, unify. For Jackson, it was a turn to making constructions. Bicycling around the 10th Avenue terminal in San Diego, he saw the shapes of shipping, flat flanges, and rivet patterns of the waterfront, all beautifully engineered and put together. In his words, I was inspired by them, by the details. Some I abstracted, some are directly derived. This is a work by Ella Marie called Now Emblem from 1966. It's a two-sided enamel structure that's now at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. It was shown together with this work by Jackson uh, called Bonus um, in the, from 1967 in the 1969 Objects USA exhibition, which toured around the United States. So in the late 1960s, as I mentioned, Ella Marie's work became increasingly abstract. Influenced by pop and op art trends popular at the time, she created a series of two-dimensional, unmodulated enamel panels through which the placement of color and shape appears to move in and out of space. Of this work, she said, while the enameling process used is really quite elemental, it has been the most demanding and difficult work I have yet done. There is no place to hide. So here we're seeing some like it hot, this kind of cross shape um, on the center lower row, and to its left, some like it cold. Those are both at the Everson Museum of Art, and they're from um, about 1965 to 1968. Um, on the right, is another one at the uh, Everson Museum of Art. Um, and uh, that one's called No End and it's from 1970. And you can see it's um, not quite two dimensional, kind of projects off the wall. And then on the upper left hand corner is Twice Over, which was um, also happened to be featured on the cover of the catalog for California's Designing Women, um, a show at the Autry in about 2012. It's pretty recognizable. And then um, in the center there, that top center is a piece by uh, Jackson that was reproduced in black and white on the cover of that enamel of classics catalog. And it's called Spectroform 5. And here you're seeing it on view when it was in Oceanside um, in, on a, an exhibition in 2015 curated by Dave Hampton. Um, and you can see he, it was a pretty challenging medium, but he really liked to um, line up the holes in just such a way that if you um, moved around the sculpture in, in different lights, it makes the colors change and it makes the appearance change. So he wanted to create this kind of sense of movement and um, different kinds of light, but he didn't want to add any kind of motors. So it's, it's always a static uh, thing. It's really, really stunning in person. So, Sadly, um, Ella Marie's life was cut short by cancer, and she passed away in 1976 when she was only 63 years old. When you look at how her work evolved, you can only imagine how it would have continued to change and had she lived um, a few more decades. Uh, after, um, after her death, there was uh, an extensive six-week retrospective exhibition of her work at the San Diego Fine Arts Gallery, again, SDMA. Um, and, but after that, Jackson retreated from the arts community. Um, eventually, his failing eyesight and significant hearing loss, which he attributed to hammering all that um, repousse metal, 
um, made him kind of go into seclusion. And I'm not aware of any more art after um, made by him after she, after she passed. So on that happy note, um, I just wanted to wrap up by just showing um, sort of the legacy of the Woolies. Um, here you're seeing some California enamelists. Actually, they're all these are all women here. Um, and they're all yeah, they're all from California. Some were her contemporaries. Some um, were influenced by her. Starting um, on the upper left, clockwise, you've got uh, Joanne Tanzer, and then um, you got uh, June Schwartz. Below that, uh, Kate Whitcomb, um, who was also that piece was also featured in Crafting Opportunity, and then this beautiful box by uh, Phyllis Whalen. So I just wanted to thank you for bearing with me through this uh, Zoom lecture. Wanted to thank the Minge, especially, especially uh, Stacy Kelly, the program director for San Diego Design Week. And um, a special thank you to curator and collector extraordinaire, Dave Hampton, who was gracious enough to lend me some of his files and books since I couldn't um, get to some of our um, San Diego resources due to the pandemic, such as the San Diego History Center collection. Um, also wanted to thank Steve Aldana and his esoteric, esoteric survey blog, which is just a great, if you haven't checked that out, it's a really good resource for mid-century things. And he's also a wonderful collector. His photos came in handy. And finally, um, a thank you to uh, Sarah, Sarah Latimer, Latimer from Francis Parker for digging up those old yearbooks for me and sending me those snapshots. Since this piece is being pre-recorded, I just want to invite anyone who has any questions or comments um, to email me. Um, I'd be happy to, to get back to you and answer any questions that you may have. Again, thank you so much and enjoy San Diego Design Week. Bye-bye.